There was this passage in a book I was reading and when I came across it, it hit me like a truck. It says, his personal office adjacent to his laboratory reflected focus as well. A prominent scientist called it small and bare, as empty as possible without the photographs, mementos, pictures, unused books and other friendly items that usually adorn and clutter a workplace. The austerity symbolized how much he had given up all aspects of his life for the sake of utter concentration on a few chosen goals. For in digging deep, he did not wish to be disturbed. He was not rude or unkind or ungenerous, far from it. Young investigators who worked under him became his most loyal admirers, but he burrowed in deeper and deeper into the world of his own making, a world, however narrow, that he could define and over which exert some control. So that's a passage taken from John Barry's The Great Influenza, a really detailed book about the Spanish flu. And the person that he's talking about is Oswald Avery, who's praised as being the most deserving scientist not to receive the Nobel Prize for his work. He was the first person to discover that genes are made of DNA, which then led to the groundbreaking discovery of DNA structure a decade later. But Avery never received the proper recognition for his input. Now, not only is Avery's story fascinating in itself, but when I first read that description of his working environment, I couldn't stop thinking about it. This great man sitting there in a plain basic room undisturbed because his work was so complex and important that it needed his full concentration. And then you look at the environments that most of us work in today. I mean, if you include my phone and my iPad, I have five different screens on my desk. I have all kinds of trinkets and resources around me. But what most of this really boils down to is distraction. Now, before you click away thinking this is just another video about being less distracted, hold your horses, this is about much more than that. You see, the important thing here is about how our brains have changed and how we experience the world differently as a result of that. And more specifically for us as traders, it's about how this negatively impacts our trading performance without us even realizing. And ultimately, it's about what you can do to reverse it. The fixes that we'll discuss will improve your trading ability probably more than any other lesson that you could watch today. Now, a little while ago, I was doing a remote trading session with a trader that I was mentoring, and we'd be on a video call and be discussing what's happening in the markets during the US session. But every few minutes, I noticed him looking away from the screen and reaching for something. It kept catching my eye, so I started wondering what he was doing. And I soon realized he was grabbing his phone. So I asked him what was going on, thinking it was part of his trading process since it was happening so frequently. And he replied, I don't even know, it's just a habit. So basically what he was doing is opening Instagram, scrolling mindlessly for a moment, and then putting his phone back down once he realized what he was doing. And he explained to me how frustrated he was that he didn't even notice each time he did it. It was just on autopilot. And it seems strange to me as well, but then I started to notice it everywhere. It didn't matter what people were doing, if they had a moment where they weren't fully engaged, they'd immediately reach for their phone, like a habit. The funniest one was when I was watching a movie and almost everyone in the room was simultaneously scrolling on their phones. Even a movie wasn't engaging enough. Now, I'm sure you're already aware of this and there's a good chance that you're in the same boat as well. But what you may find shocking is how terrible this can be for your trading in ways that you might not expect. So let's start by addressing the root cause. These days, we've all become addicted to cheap dopamine. Dopamine drives our behavior, among other things. We always want more of it, so we continue to take the actions that lead to its production. Ultimately, it's not the action that we're craving, it's the dopamine that's released as a result of it. Now, surprisingly, one of the things that can spike our dopamine is information. But most people misunderstand what information actually is. In the 1950s, Claude Shannon, an engineer at Bell Labs, discovered the connection between information and novelty. When we receive some sort of message, the amount of information contained within it is proportional to the amount of novelty or uncertainty within it. Now, this might sound strange because it seems like novelty or unpredictability somehow should be the opposite of information. However, if something is real information, it should tell us something that we don't already know. In other words, there's novelty. The neuroscientist John Coates points out that most of the messages we receive in our daily lives are actually predictable. They contain a lot of noise rather than information. And he gives a great example of this using text messages. So imagine your spouse isn't home on time and after half an hour, you get a message from them saying, I am late, the car has a flat tire, 
I'll be home in one hour. A lot of that isn't information. Firstly, if they're not home on time, you already know that they're late. If they have a flat tire, you know it's from the car, and so on. You can basically condense that whole message to just the information. Flat tire, home one hour. You see, the part that's actually information is the unpredictable bit, it's the novelty. And this isn't something trivial. It's important to us because actually our sensory systems are designed to attend almost exclusively to information. We ignore predictable events and focus on novelty. And there are many amazing ways that we can see these systems taking place in our brains, but that's something for another time. But essentially all of this can help to explain how and why we get addicted to the endless novelty of social media. It's constant stimulation and that stimulation spikes our dopamine and we want more of it. But this has all led to an even bigger issue. You see, as we're driven to stimulate ourselves with more and more novelty, these days we've become hyper-stimulated and this can have a disastrous effect on our brains. You see, the more overstimulated we are, the more desensitized we become to dopamine. In other words, we develop a low sensitivity to the reward that comes from stimulation, so it doesn't focus our attention in the same way anymore. That means we need even more stimulation to focus our attention and more and more. So 20 years ago, a movie would have captivated everyone's attention, but now it's not enough stimulation on its own, so people grab their phones. We've drifted so far from the sort of hyper-focused environment of an Oswald Avery. And this overstimulation has a really negative effect on your trading. As John Coates puts it, it's been said of war that it consists of long stretches of boredom punctuated by brief periods of terror. And much the same can be said of trading. Basically, trading involves extended periods of low stimulation interrupted by brief instances of intense stimulation. But those boring, low stimulation phases still need your full focus. You need to detect information in the markets, do accurate analysis, assess the opportunities, strategize your trades. But if done correctly, this mentally demanding but low stimulation part should be completed before the emotionally demanding high stimulation moments of being in a trade. And this is where the seemingly innocent need for hyper stimulation can destroy your trading performance in many ways. Here are some of the main ones. The first one is lack of focus. You might get bored watching the charts and do other things to provide more stimulation. Maybe listening to audiobooks or podcasts or high stimulation music, watching YouTube or Netflix, or opening a million different browser tabs to scan through news, social media, forums, and so on. Your attention isn't focused on your trading. So you end up performing badly, making mistakes, and missing vital signals in the markets. Alternatively, you might start taking unnecessary actions to provide more stimulation. Things like opening trades, adjusting your stop loss, or scaling in, scaling out. Your need for stimulation drives you away from your trading plan. Or maybe you try to satisfy your addiction to information by constantly switching between different markets, clicking from one chart to another in search of novelty. Once again, you end up dividing your focus, missing important information, and impulsively opening or closing trades. And as we can discuss in a future video, there are proven benefits of sticking with just one market from both a neurological and practical perspective. The next one relates to a trading cliche, but it's true. The key to success is to cut your losses and let your profits run. But holding on to profitable trades without needing to take any action isn't very stimulating. So this can lead you to close your profitable trades early, essentially sacrificing your returns just to cure your boredom. As the fund manager Lee Freeman Shaw discovered after studying hundreds of different fund managers, one of the key requirements of staying invested in a big winner is to have or cultivate a high boredom threshold. And finally, similar to the second point of overtrading, your need for stimulation could influence the type of strategies that you choose to use. Rather than choosing an approach that's based on performance, you might opt for a fast paced active approach just to gain more stimulation. So then the big question is, how can we fix this? Well, unfortunately, there isn't an overnight miracle cure for the issue. Instead, this is a process that requires a long-term commitment. But on the bright side, you should begin to notice a positive change quite rapidly. There are basically two objectives that you need to achieve. You need to resensitize yourself to dopamine and build your focus endurance. And ultimately, all of this just comes down to developing and refining the ultimate trading superpower, 
boredom. So the goal with resensitizing yourself to dopamine is to detach yourself from the excessive cheap dopamine that we all get all the time. That way you can adjust back to needing less stimulation to focus your attention. So the first thing is to stop layering on the stimulation. As you become desensitized to dopamine, you need more of it to feel rewarded. You end up adding more and more layers of stimulation, like a teenager playing Call of Duty with music blaring, scrolling social media between games and downing energy drinks. The simple fix is to stop layering the stimulation. Just focus on one thing at a time. If you're analyzing your charts, that's all you should be doing. You don't also need to listen to a podcast or watch YouTube. If you're making a cup of coffee, just make the coffee. You don't need to also open WhatsApp while you're waiting. Let individual tasks take your full focus, one task at a time. It might seem boring at first because you're used to being overstimulated, but you'll soon start to readjust. As Haruki Murakami wrote, Somerset Maugham once wrote that in each shave lies a philosophy. I couldn't agree more. No matter how mundane some action might appear, keep at it long enough and it becomes a contemplative, even meditative act. This next principle follows on from the first one. You should allow yourself to have moments of boredom. You don't need to fill every second of your day with a form of stimulation. If you're taking a break from the charts, don't immediately pick up your phone or watch a video. Allow yourself to do nothing. Embrace the boredom. By the time you then get back to the charts, they'll feel like the most captivating thing in the world rather than a disappointment after a wave of stimulation. The next step is to increase the duration of your focus. We can think of our mental endurance in a similar way to physical endurance. It can be trained and improved with the right approach. And I'd recommend incorporating these two practices into your routine. The first one is mindfulness meditation. Even dedicating as little as 10 minutes per day to mindfulness meditation can enhance your awareness of the thoughts that manifest in your mind. And this awareness is beneficial because it allows you to transform habitual thought responses into a more conscious process. So this can help you control your urge for distractions during a trading session. The second thing is focus training. So when you're about to engage in a focused activity, like for example, your analysis, start a timer. Then as soon as your mind begins to drift away and you start feeling distracted, stop the timer and write down how much time passed. Then take a break, obviously allowing yourself to be bored. And you can now approach this in a similar way to progressive overload for building strength at the gym. The time that you noted down is now the target that you have to beat in the next session. So during your next session, add some time to your previous record and set an alarm for that duration. So for example, if you achieved seven minutes in the previous session, you might now set an alarm for 10 minutes. And your goal is to remain focused and battle against any distractions that come up until the alarm goes off. Now, if you succeed, you can increase that time again in the next session. And if you fail, you can try again at the same duration or reduce it slightly for the next one, but still making sure that it's longer than your previous record. So each new session becomes an opportunity to push your mind to surpass your previous focus duration and increase how long you're able to focus for. Then what you can do is just periodically test your focus endurance by setting the timer and seeing how long you can go for without being distracted and just monitor how much you improve over time. Now, I know that all of this that we've just discussed seems like a trivial topic and that there are more important things you could be focusing on with your trading. But trust me, the issues that I outlined that come from this problem are very real. Now, if you focus on this as seriously as you would other areas of your trading, you'll probably see a bigger improvement in your performance, more so than other things that you could be working on. In an ideal world, of course, we'd all have the discipline of an Oswald Avery to remove all stimulation and distractions and focus solely on complex tasks that change the course of history. But even just starting with the small steps that I've outlined in this video, you'll be able to transform your own future.